Uh, so what the crap? Nice to see all of you. It's my first time here. Uh, very excited. And I got a lot of stuff to cover. So let's just jump right in here. Uh, there's my basic information. Uh, I have been a, a Java JVM guy pretty much my whole career, uh, about 24, 25 years now. And amazingly, about 13 years now of working full time on a Ruby implementation, which has been very exciting. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, the sponsorship of Red Hat. And as I mentioned, for my first time here, I'm going to spend a few days here and then do some uh, uh, exploring in Chiang Mai. And uh, I'm very excited. All right. Mentioned uh, Red Hat. Again, thanks very much for sponsoring us. Uh, we've uh, had some great sponsors over the years that have kept the project going. We started out at Sun Microsystems. Uh, we were at Engine Yard for a while. And now over six years that we've been at Red Hat. And they're funding two of us to work full time uh, on JRuby. Uh, we're also excited to see what happens with IBM. Uh, as far as we know, Red Hat stays Red Hat, but we're going to get the additional uh, resources uh, and help from IBM to make stuff really, really shine. So looking forward to that too. All right, so let's get into it here and talk a little bit about JRuby. How many folks uh, are familiar with JRuby? Okay, about a third of the room, I suppose. How many people have a JRuby application, or have ever done a JRuby application in production? All right, great. There's still like, like maybe a fifth or sixth of the room there. All right, so for the folks that are not familiar with JRuby, it's just a Ruby implementation. That is our primary goal with it, always, is to be as much a drop-in Ruby replacement as possible. Uh, currently, our current version is compatible with Ruby 2.5. Uh, we're looking to do either 2.6 or 2.7 for the next major JRuby release. Uh, if you find something that's not working that's just Ruby code, don't assume it's your fault. Let us know. There's a very good chance that we've missed some weird edge case, and we can fix it up and get a new release out real quick. Uh, pretty much any pure Ruby gems ought to work just fine. Uh, we actually ship a, a very slightly modified version of CRuby's pure, pure Ruby standard library. Uh, and most of the major C extensions and, and native libraries that are out there have JRuby versions or an equivalent library that will work well. Uh, but like I say, we want to be a Ruby implementation first. And then, after that, also be a JVM language and give you all of the power and all of the, the capabilities of the Java platform. So what kind of things am I talking about? Well, oh, here, I, I had to throw this in at the last minute. Uh, just in the past couple days, I, I saw this tweet uh, from Michelle on Twitter. Uh, and she has two kitties uh, that are named Java and Ruby. Uh, and they, uh, they play together, and they have a lot of fun. And somebody else replied, and they thought, oh, hey, so this is how I found it. It came up in my JRuby search. So if they have a kitten together, yeah, that would have to be, have to be JRuby. And then she came back a couple days later, and here it is, Java and Ruby, happy together. <laughs> that sums it up right there, I think. That's the goal. We want JRuby to be Java and Ruby working together, but still the, the, the capabilities and the power of both sides. All right, so there they are. So what kind of benefits are we talking about uh, JVM, Java platform-wise? Well, the, having it be widely deployed is nice. It's available on every platform. Uh, of course, you have the amazing native JIT capabilities for performance. GC is never a problem. There's so many garbage selectors out there that are really amazing on the, on the JVM. Uh, concurrency, platforms, and all, all the support across many different platforms. Uh, libraries, tooling, uh, Write once, run anywhere. We've got folks that deploy JRuby on the most weird, exotic platforms with zero modifications to their apps. All the libraries work, all the drivers work. It just runs pretty much everywhere that the JVM runs. I mentioned concurrency. Uh, so this is my machine when I was running some benchmarks for this system. I've got my, my four or you know, eight virtual cores. Uh, and one JRuby process will be able to light up all the cores, use all the resources in the system. You don't have to spin up many, many different processes. You can get the best out of your CPU with just a single JRuby instance. Uh, this is an example of a tool called uh, Visual VM. Uh, and it's actually uh, using a plugin on the right called Visual GC, which is showing a live view of the JVM's garbage collector as each of the generations fills up with objects, gets cleared out, and the garbage goes away. Uh, on the left, just some basic metrics there, show you what CPU usage looks like, show you how many threads are running in the, in the JRuby instance. And this is just one of, of thousands of tools that are out there for monitoring, profiling, and managing JVM-based applications. Uh, this one happens to also be free as part of the OpenJDK project. 
Uh, I mentioned that we've got lots of libraries out there. Of course, we've got uh, over 150,000 unique different gems in the Ruby gems world. You can add to that over 340,000 JVM libraries that are available that do just about everything you can imagine. If there's a library that you can't find in the Ruby world, there's probably a JVM library out there that you can pull into JRuby easily. Uh, some of those libraries are fun things. Uh, here's an example of a Minecraft plugin framework written in JRuby. Uh, the code on the left is all you need to modify how many chickens come out of an egg when you throw it. Uh, the funny story behind this is that Tom tested this out and made this video. Uh, Tom is my, my co-conspirator on, on the JRuby project. Uh, he tested this out in a world that he actually intended to keep building things in and creating new stuff. But after creating several hundred thousand chickens in his experiments, he essentially had to throw the whole world away. Uh, sending wolves in did not solve the problem. It just made it worse. So, but the great fun that you can have with stuff that's built on the JVM using Ruby. So JRuby really is Ruby plus the best parts of the JVM. We try to uh, hide the fact that we're running on top of the Java platform, hide some of the weird edges of the, of the JVM, and make it just feel like a Ruby that has so much more power. A uh, quick little roadmap on JRuby. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the current JRuby version is Ruby 2.5 compatible. That's 9.2.8. Uh, we have finished off the 9.1 line, that was our 2.3 compatible, uh, and we're likely going to skip over 2.6. We're kind of going every other major Ruby version here. Uh, the reason behind this is that keeping up with compatibility is a, a lot of work. It's usually best if we can just focus for a few months on compatibility, and then the rest of the time we do user support, performance, optimization, and so on. Uh, so most likely we are going to wait until 2.7 is done uh, at the end of this year, and then next spring we'll come out with JRuby 9.3 uh, supporting Ruby 2.7 compatibility. Now, this is a great place where you can help. Uh, as new Ruby features come out, we're always looking for folks to help us implement them, add them to JRuby so we keep up. Uh, and it's fine if you want to use Ruby code. We have a large part of JRuby that's just written in Ruby. If there's a new feature that you can implement in a few lines of Ruby code, submit a pull request. Maybe we optimize it later, maybe it runs just as well as, as uh, written in Java, so it doesn't have to be a, a Java-based patch. And we're always standing by to kind of help people out and, and get them bootstrapped on helping JRuby. All right, so as a, as a user, as a Ruby user, how would you get started with JRuby? Uh, we do have a site uh, with downloads and community information and, and chat links and whatnot, uh, so you can certainly just go download JRuby from here. Uh, really, the only prerequisite for getting JRuby running is that you have some JDK installed. Uh, my personal favorite distribution is Adopt Open JDK. Uh, they provide builds across several different platforms, several different configurations of JVM. Uh, we currently recommend Java 8 because Java 9 Plus has some, some security and module stuff that will warn a little bit on, on some JRuby things. It's harmless but noisy. That's all that's really about it there. Uh, so then install JRuby. Like I say, you can download the tarball or zip, you can use our Windows installer if, if you're a Windows-based developer, uh, but generally we recommend just go get RVM or whatever your favorite Ruby installer is, tell it to install JRuby, they all know about it, uh, and you'll have JRuby running on your system in no time. Uh, here's a quick example using RVM. Uh, oh, wait, nope, there. Okay, there we go. Doesn't show on my screen, it's creepy. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm skipping gem sets here just to kind of speed the process. Uh, this is a little bit older video, JRuby 9.2.4, and then we're up and going. That's all there is to it. Uh, it doesn't have to build JRuby because it's JVM based. As long as you've got a JDK, it will just run. And then that's it. You've got a working JRuby implementation and you can start doing all of the stuff I show here today. Uh, so let's take a look at running a, a JRuby in IRB. Of course, it's the Java world, so we put a J on everything. It's J-I-R-B for us. Uh, you can just run IRB as well. J-I-R-B is just a convenient shortcut. Here I am calling into some Java libraries. Uh, this is the Swing GUI toolkit that comes with OpenJDK. Uh, so we create a frame, we create a button, uh, we add the button to the frame, uh, set the size to what is something visible so we can see it, and then we show the frame. And now we've got a live frame that is a, a GUI that will work all across platforms on, on any platform where OpenJDK works, and you've got a screen. Uh, we can add some event handling to our button, 
And then when we click it, our Ruby code runs, and you've just written a little GUI in a few lines of Ruby code. Uh, there's also the whole JavaFX framework, which is supported by JRuby, kind of the newer GUI toolkit for building JVM-based desktop apps. Uh, certainly beats trying to find the right GUI toolkit and the right libraries on each platform. Just write it in Ruby, install the JVM, and you've got a, a desktop application. Uh, a few notes on, on gems and paths. Uh, sometimes uh, the system installers for Ruby will try to share gem paths, uh, so keep an eye out for that. There are different versions of some libraries for JRuby, um, so we want to kind of keep our gems separate from CRubies uh, and just to keep the confusion down. Uh, and one thing that, keep, that always bites me, a lot of projects and libraries use the .ruby version file to automatically switch to a specific Ruby version. Uh, it often does that completely silently, and suddenly you're back in CRuby and not running JRuby anymore. So something to keep an eye out if you start playing around with JRuby on your own. Uh, I mentioned that we're always available for help. Uh, we, we do have a mailing list. Uh, we are on various chat services. Should be pretty easy to find us. Uh, and then, of course, our, our, our GitHub project and the JRuby organization. All right, so let's talk a little bit about JRuby's architecture. Uh, so we are what we would call a tiered architecture, which means we have many different layers of execution and optimization. Uh, so our Ruby code comes in here on the left. Uh, we parse and compile that into our internal Ruby instructions, very similar to how, Ruby, uh, how CRuby has its own VM and its own bytecode. Uh, then we pass that off to our own interpreter, written in Java. That interpreter will run the code for a while, and as it gets hotter and it sees that you're using certain methods more, we pass that off to the JVM as JVM bytecode. Our, that's our own JIT phase. So we turn it into JVM bytecode, and then the JVM basically repeats this same process. It interprets the bytecode for a while, does a, a quick optimization, runs it a little bit more, uh, turns that into better native code, and then this cycle will repeat. So basically, the longer you run your Ruby code on JRuby, the faster it will get. And it shows in some of these benchmarks. I'll show a little bit about the high performance, the peak performance, uh, and some of the warm-up uh, warm time you see. So let's talk first about low-level performance. Um, one of my main jobs on JRuby is optimization, memory optimization, performance optimization. Uh, I wrote the JIT and some of the, the, the back-end optimization that feeds it into the JVM. I end up looking at a lot of assembly code to see how this stuff performs, and you get to benefit. I look at assembly code so you don't have to. OK, I'm going to show some micro benchmarks here to begin with. Uh, of course, generally these are not useful things unless your business is generating Fibonacci sequences or something. Uh, but they are interesting for us to kind of explore what the, the, uh, the, the low-level aspects of performance in JRuby are. Uh, they're fun to show off and improve. It's easier for us to isolate specific things. Uh, for example, Fibonacci or Mandelbrot or whatever will help us test numeric performance. Uh, and it's also a quick way for us to try out new JVMs, new JITs, new garbage collectors, and see how they're doing on Ruby code. Uh, so the first one, again, not a particularly useful benchmark, uh, but it generates a fractal. Uh, good test of numeric algorithm performance. This uh, is very heavy on floating point math uh, and heavily relies on the JVM to take this code and ideally turn it into the optimized, fastest possible native code. Here's our little benchmark. You can see mostly just numeric operations here, uh, a couple nested while loops, uh, and then uh, at the end we get uh, Mandelbrot fractal generated. So let's see how this looks across a, a few different uh, uh, Ruby configurations here. We have CRuby 2.5 uh, coming in about 3.6 seconds. Uh, the JIT is still coming along. I would hope to see more numeric improvement on, on benchmarks like this, uh, but for now, it's kind of a mediocre, mediocre improvement at this point. Uh, then we have JRuby here uh, with just uh, regular uh, execution, not using invoke dynamic, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and I'll skip this because that column is supposed to be later. Uh, I mentioned invoke dynamic. So this is kind of a, our next tier of optimizing JRuby. First, we turn it into JVM bytecode, and then we leverage the features of the JVM. Uh, this was added in Java 7 uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, it's essentially JVM support for dynamic languages. And of course, this works very well for us. We worked very closely with the JVM engineers to make sure it could optimize Ruby code well. Uh, I mentioned Java 7, and we helped them out a lot with it. 
Uh, this has been steadily uh, improving over time. The performance continues to get better, uh, the amount of time it takes to optimize gets lower and lower, and it's been using less and less memory. Uh, currently, this is an opt-in that you do with JRuby. You can pass a flag that says, turn on the Invoke Dynamic compilation, uh, mostly because it impacts startup and warm-up time a little bit. If you want peak performance, definitely will get you there, uh, but maybe for day-to-day -day development, you don't need to run with that. Uh, so here, let's take a look at what our, our, our Invoke Dynamic performance looks like. Again, we have our CRuby JIT, our JRuby, and then a big improvement, better than twice as fast. Uh, we see anywhere from two to five times performance improvement turning on Invoke Dynamic, depending on what kind of code you're running. And now we're also very excited that there are a wide range of JVMs and JVM JIT compilers out there. Uh, very recently, IBM's OpenJ9, a completely different JVM from OpenJDK, uh, has been open sourced. We're starting to play around with that. Uh, and also very exciting, there's a new JIT called Graal. Uh, Graal is a, a JIT compiler for the JVM that itself is written entirely in Java, which means that it's been able to evolve very quickly, it's been able to incorporate much more advanced optimizations, and we're really starting to see some crazy improvements on, on Ruby code now. Let's take a look and compare these again. Here is our CRuby 2.6 JIT performance, uh, as it was. The regular JRuby performance. Where is the... Oh, here we go. This is the one I want. So here is the CRuby JIT, JRuby Invoke Dynamic. There's our nice bump, bump from it, uh, the Indie performance. And now, the really exciting stuff. New JIT technology. All we gotta do is flip a switch on the JVM, and bam. 10 times improvement over our best numbers. This is now very, very close to what it would be if you just wrote this code in Java directly, rather than writing it in Ruby. Uh, it's really exciting stuff. I've taken a look at the assembly code, and it's practically there. It's practically the same stuff. All right. So, moving on. We also do a lot of work trying to optimize JRuby in memory. Uh, JVM applications are traditionally thought of as kind of big. And yes, it's very easy to create too many objects. It's very easy to let the GC just clean up your mess after you. But we want to try and keep Ruby in JRuby as compact and tight as possible. Uh, so what are some things that we're looking at? Well, Ruby instance variables are dynamic. But usually we can predict what a given object is going to have. We don't need to implement it like a hash table, which would be terribly inefficient if all objects were basically hashes. Uh, Ruby arrays are also mutable, but typically you're using small arrays, you're getting it filled with the information you want, and then not making a lot of changes after that. We can try to optimize that as well. So the trick we're using right now is we look at your instance variables, we look at how you're using your arrays, and try to compact it down. Uh, turn those instance variables or those array elements into JVM fields, avoid having all this extra overhead for a growable array behind the scenes. Uh, it's, for those of you who know how CRuby works, this is very similar to storing a few instance variables or a few array elements uh, in the actual header of the object. Keeps it more compact, local to the CPU cache, uh, and avoids that extra memory overhead. Let's see how this looks. Uh, here's what you would see if you ran a, a JRuby a JVM memory profile. And you can see we've got lots of different sizes of Ruby objects here. We're detecting how many instance variables are actually needed at runtime and allocating an object that's exactly the right size, rather than having it grow and change and, and have extra layers of abstraction. Uh, and this leads to about a 33% memory reduction. This, uh, we shipped just this past spring, uh, actually. Uh, so a bunch of applications now use considerably less memory when they deploy on JRuby. Uh, similarly, the array optimization here. Uh, we are only doing specialization for one and two element arrays. But it turns out in a simple, array, uh, a simple Rails uh, active record benchmark that more than half of the arrays allocated are one or two element arrays that never change size. So just by doing this very simple optimization, we've managed to cut half of those arrays down considerably. Uh, and again, it's about a 33% memory reduction. We don't have all of, those ex all of that extra array overhead. We don't have that extra abstraction. So a lot of work that we're doing to try and get performance working. Uh, take a step back here and, and mention one caveat. I mentioned earlier the warm-up time, the tiered execution. Uh, runtime optimizations do an excellent job of optimizing Ruby code. We are really able to get seriously high performance compared to pretty much every other Ruby implementation right now. Uh, but unfortunately, startup time and warm-up time are 
impacted by this. Uh, we continue to reduce this impact over time, but I, I want to be honest with you uh, and, and show you how to kind of get around some of this, this startup time impact. Uh, so what kind, of, what kind of startup time are we talking about? Uh, it's not great. Uh, this is CRuby versus JRuby without passing any flags uh, and, you know, five, ten times slower for certain commands. Uh, depending on how many gems you have, this, this gap will go up. And this can be a pain in a development environment to have this running uh, every time you run a command to have to take this performance hit. Uh, so why is this? Is this something that we're doing wrong? Well, if you look at CRuby, most, most of the code that runs when you boot up a Ruby application is written in C. It's already optimized down to native code. Uh, in JRuby, that's pretty much the exact opposite. Almost everything that runs in JRuby is JVM bytecode. It needs to warm up. It needs to go through that whole tiered execution. The JIT finally optimizes it, but it's usually too late for startup time. It means that we don't really get to our peak performance until 5, 10, 15 seconds into the application run. It means the commands take a little bit longer to get going. Uh, and in fact, if we run these commands repeatedly in the same JVM, we start to get down very close to CRuby's performance. The JVM does optimize this stuff eventually, but initially it ends up being a little slower than we like. Uh, so probably the best way to get around this right now is a flag we have called dash dash dev that you can use in a development environment. Uh, generally exported in an uh, in environment variable, so it's picked up by all your JRuby processes. Uh, and this basically disables our JIT, which adds a little bit of startup overhead. It tunes the JVM JIT to not work quite as hard at the beginning of execution. Uh, because it turns these things off, make sure you don't try and benchmark against it. But this will get you 30, 40, sometimes 50% reduction in JRuby startup time. Uh, so if you start using JRuby, definitely remember dash dash dev flag for local development uh, can save you a little bit of a headache there. We are also looking at being able to compile JRuby ahead of time into native code. Uh, as part of the Graal project, there is a way to take JVM applications, compile the whole thing down to native code, and then they should start up much faster. Uh, the Truffle Ruby project, another, another uh, JVM-ish based Ruby implementation, is using this currently to, to boost their startup performance. Uh, we're hoping to take it a, a little bit beyond what they've got. Uh, we want to try and compile JRuby and your Ruby code down to native, uh, native code. At least we can do that for all of your gems, for all of the standard library, so JRuby and your code, your libraries, will start up much faster in the future. Uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, showing a little bit how this helps uh, JRuby versus Truffle Ruby, here is our uh, dash E1, probably our best, best time, about 1.7 seconds, passing the dash dash dev flag. Uh, Truffle Ruby with their native compilation definitely gets a big boost here. This is pretty much as fast as running with CRuby. Uh, but because they don't pre-compile any Ruby code, uh, they end up having significantly worse startup time uh, for larger commands. Uh, this is what we want to actually solve. We want to get down to that 0.5 seconds for something like listing all of your gems or running Rails commands. Uh, so we'll work with them and with the Graal team to get this to happen in the future. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about web applications, performance-wise, how you make a move to JRuby. Uh, so I've got some small and some large examples here. Uh, my small examples, I'm using Sinatra and Rhoda. Uh, some very trivial little benchmarks that are, are part of this uh, Ruby Benchmarks project. Uh, I was inspired this morning to try and get the Hanami example to work, but it has some database dependencies. I didn't, wasn't able to work through the exact details of those but you should see similar performance improvement on something like Hanami uh, to what you have with Sinatra and Rhoda here. And then of course I will show Rails uh, and show some uh, small apps versus some large applications. Uh, so Sinatra and Rhoda, very well supported on JRuby. Uh, we have many production users that are using Sinatra for very large scale applications. Uh, some years ago, uh, the company called The Guilt Group, who does a lot of flash sales, uh, huge amounts of users coming in within an hour or two of a new sale coming out. They were pushing tens, hundreds of thousands of requests through a JRuby Sinatra application. Uh, we hear this kind of thing all the time. Really can scale up small services extremely well on JRuby. Uh, the examples I have here are very simple. They don't have any database. They're not hitting other services. But it'll give you an idea of what the bare bones request processing uh, can do in JRuby with all of our optimizations. All right, so let's take a look. 
I am comparing CRuby and JRuby and Truffle Ruby here across these uh, two uh, frameworks. Uh, so here's Sinatra in CRuby, getting about 12,000 requests per second. JRuby makes a big difference here. Uh, almost four times improvement, about three and a half times performance, whoop, there it is, three and a half times performance improvement. Uh, just by switching to JRuby, passing the invoke dynamic flag, you can turn the, the performance level of a Sinatra app way up. Uh, I did try some of these on Truffle Ruby. I was hoping to show some, some better results. I think there's still some, some work to be done. Uh, they're, they're not quite up to CRuby performance yet on these benchmarks. Uh, similarly with Rhoda, we've got 14,000, almost 15,000 uh, requests per second in CRuby. Uh, a similar ratio, 44,000 requests uh, running this on JRuby. Exact same application. Uh, again, Truffle Ruby seemed to take a hit here, so I started to wonder what might be wrong uh, with the Truffle Ruby results. Uh, and one thing that it turns out, I was running with Puma here. Puma has a native extension, and in order to support native C extensions, Truffle Ruby has to have basically a global lock around them. Can't trust that C code, can't trust that native memory. So I thought I'd run this again and just run with a single thread. Uh, and then as you'll see, JRuby goes down. We, we take about a... About a uh, we go down to about 25%, so it's a four-core system. Uh, so that's not surprising. Truffle Ruby doesn't really go down at all. So they're, they're kind of bottlenecked on the C extensions. And this is something that I'm sure they'll work on. Uh, I wanted to show this side of it to, to demonstrate that there are reasons why this isn't quite there yet. Uh, so I thought, hey, let's, let's use a, a web, web framework, a web server implementation that doesn't use a native extension. Uh, so I thought I'd throw a web brick at it. Why not? If we could run WebRick well, then maybe we can see some similar numbers on the, on the Truffle Ruby side. Uh, it turns out that JRuby actually runs this application with WebRick faster than on Puma, using a native HTTP parser and an optimized request loop and everything. So we can run, we, just with our optimizations, we can beat Puma using WebRick. Um, and as expected, this did give a little bit of improvement to Truffle Ruby. Uh, so C extensions, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of a problem for Ruby these days. Uh, I, I wish these guys all the best in the world, best of luck in the world, uh, to try and support them, but this, is, this will be an ongoing problem, most likely. Uh, now, I want to be honest again about our warm-up time performance. Uh, so when I first start this, after the first five seconds of cranking requests through it, uh, we do come in a little bit slower than CRuby. Uh, a lot of folks will run their early benchmarks, assume that JRuby's not going to be able to perform, and then just give up on it. Uh, but Again, as we run, we optimize, the JVM optimizes, slowly our performance ends up climbing well, well above CRuby. Uh, the same uh, graph here, uh, Rhoda's a little bit simpler than Sinatra, doesn't have quite as much reflective magic internally, so our numbers are pretty much the same as CRuby, and then it just keeps going up from there. All right, so let's move on from small frameworks to something a little bit more uh, substantial here. Uh, so, uh, JRuby on Rails also can really benefit from the JVM, from the libraries, the garbage collector, the JIT. Uh, and the best part about this is one JRuby on Rails process can handle your entire site. Doesn't matter how much hardware you want to throw at it, we will make use of it. We will handle hundreds, thousands of requests from users at the same time. Uh, are there users of JRuby in Rail, Rails in production? Well, I just heard about one today that's deploying JRuby on Rails as a packaged application uh, for companies here in Thailand. We hear this all the time. JRuby's out there. JRuby's scaling some really large applications. It's stable and it works really well. Uh, and we've, we've been thrilled to hear, have all these great users tell us these stories. Uh, and we believe that this is the, the best way to scale Rails applications today. All you have to do is start up one JRuby instance and your scaling is done. You're good to go. So how do we start making this move? How, what's, what's the differences here with JRuby on Rails? Well, the configuration differences are pretty minimal. Uh, swap some gems around, and, and if you generate a new Rails application, uh, Rails will generate all of these, these changes for you ahead of time. Uh, we have a minor change to database YAML here. Uh, we have a driver that works exactly the same as the Rails drivers do. So make a couple tweaks and you're good to go. Uh, or threads within our process. Uh, so rather than using workers, spin up multiple threads and handle all of the requests with one process. Uh, here's some, per, some of our uh, test results on Rails 6. Uh, three nines passing is pretty good. 
the kind of stuff that isn't passing is things like this. If you really have uh, a need for nanosecond accuracy on your date times, you know, talk to us, we'll see if we can help accommodate you, but these just kind of make us sad. They're probably just issues that we need to fix in the test framework. Uh, so Rails really is the thing. This is, this is what tests the completeness, the performance, the maturity of a Ruby implementation. Uh, if you can't run Rails fast, you've got work to do. This is still by far the biggest use case for Ruby, uh, web development in general and Rails specifically. And over the years, it has been very frustrating to optimize this. Uh, JRuby's run little micro benchmarks and small applications faster than CRuby for years, for almost a decade now. But Rails, only recently have we managed to finally crack that nut and, and get the performance we're looking for. So times are changing. Let's take a look at some of this. Uh, so first of all, Active Record. Uh, most Rails applications pretty much live and die by the performance of Active Record. Uh, this is where most of your overhead's gonna go. This is where most objects created in the system usually are coming from. Uh, and this is where we've spent a lot of time trying to optimize. Make sure that Active Record is fast. Hopefully the rest of Rails will come along with it. Uh, I'm doing some create and read and update measurements here. Uh, and just comparing CRuby 2.5 versus JRuby on uh, a JDK 11. Uh, we'll jump right into the numbers here. Generally, about 30% performance improvement uh, on all of the, uh, the active record benchmarks here. Uh, so this is lower is better, trying, trying to run a thousand select queries uh, with various data types. We're trying to test and make sure they all serialize across the wire properly. Uh, it, this, this pretty much carries over to the create uh, and update as well. Uh, our performance is usually going to be 20 to 30% 20 to 30 faster, uh, 20 to 30% less overhead than running the same thing in CRuby. Uh, so now what about scaling Rails itself? Well, this is kind of the classic problem on CRuby. Uh, we don't have concurrent threads. We can't actually use multiple cores at the same time, so we need to spin up separate processes. Uh, and there's lots of tricks like copy on write and the new uh, compacting garbage collection that try to reduce the overhead of having these different processes. But these processes invariably will grow on their own. They will have in-memory data sets that they need to maintain. And you're also running uh, multiple implementations of a garbage collector, multiple implementations of your database drivers. This is wasting resources across implementations. Uh, of course, we believe that JRuby is the answer for this. A single multi-threaded process can run the entire site. You've got one garbage collector, you've got one set of JITs, it's all sharing the optimizations, and it runs and takes care of all of your requests at the same time. Uh, so I have one benchmark that's just a simple Rails performance bench. Uh, this is a generated blog post application. Uh, this one I'm actually running on a, a real instance, an EC2 uh, extra large C4. Uh, Threw plenty of memory at it, gave it some warm-up time, uh, and you know, a little less scientific. I am running the database, the benchmark, and the application all in the same instance. I don't think for this benchmark it makes a whole lot of difference. Let's see what we get for requ requests per second on the simple blog post app. Here we have uh, CRuby running about a little under a thousand requests per second. JRuby getting again 20 to 30 percent performance improvement just in the throughput of full stack uh, Rails requests. Uh, and this is with really without any change to the application. Just switch over to JRuby, start it up, you can get a, a performance improvement. Uh, again, trying to be honest here about uh, what warm-up time you might see. Uh, sometimes folks will deploy a JRuby application into production and then have a, a script that might run through a few of the common operations, get the Rails code booted, get the application uh, uh, warmed up a little bit, and then, then you'll get that, that performance boost that you need for it. Uh, depending on the size of the application, this warm-up curve can get a little bit longer. Uh, we are working on various ways to, to shorten that, try to get to peak performance much quicker. So I've mentioned uh, making better uses of resources here. Uh, JRuby on Rails will generally use less memory for any large-scale Ruby application. An individual JRuby will be bigger than CRuby for sure, uh, but once you pass two, three, four CRuby instances, usually we start to come out ahead. And then, of course, you can, you can take that all the way to 100 concurrent users. You'd need 100 concurrent processes to run in CRuby. And, of course, J, a single JRuby process will, will be way ahead on memory use. Uh, the second benchmark I want to show is uh, rubygems.org. Uh, 
Uh, we actually can run rubygems.org. It's, it's largely functional. Uh, we're still working on some edge cases here. Uh, this is just running on, on uh, a machine like this here, uh, an i7, 16 gig of memory. Uh, again, running everything on the same system, uh, but a generally good example of, of what kind of performance we can get on a large application. Uh, so let's take a look here. We've got our, uh, the blue is JRuby running with Puma, a single process, using all the cores. Goes way up and, get, and, and stays up above at the top. Uh, compared to CRuby running, in this case, I think it was the 10 or 20 processes, uh, using significantly more memory than JRuby, it does get up to a point where it performs pretty well, certainly compared to a single Ruby instance. Uh, but we did start to see some errors cropping up at higher levels of concurrency, more users coming in. Uh, JRuby was able to scale well beyond this without any errors. Uh, we, these are the memory numbers that we saw. So CRuby with 20 workers versus JRuby with 20 threads. Uh, this is basically how much memory it was consuming on our system. I know that the Gem Alex stuff should help, the compacting GCs should help, the copy on write is, is sometimes helping this, but usually JRuby will use less memory for any significant application. So some takeaways for the scaling uh, here. Generally uses less memory, uh, more memory stable over time. Once we get to that peak level, it stays pretty much solid and after a little while won't continue to grow. We did see the CRuby processes continue to use more and more memory over time. Uh, certainly more CPU efficient. We are getting the best use out of the processor uh, with the downside that we have a little bit more warm-up time. So I think it's safe to say that JRuby is definitely the fastest way to run Rails applications. Uh, we're hoping that more folks will give it a try. And I'm going to have to kind of speed through this part. We started a little late, so I think I can push it a little bit maybe. Uh, all right, so migrating to JRuby. Well, so try it out. Uh, new applications will be the easiest, obviously. Existing applications will require a few extra steps. Tweaking some configurations, uh, bundling, installing, and dealing with C extensions, uh, and then running your tests. So the use case I'll go through very quickly here is discourse. Uh, this is a very large Rails application, uh, over 500 gems, 250,000 lines of Ruby code, a significant application. Uh, it's not currently supported, but it does almost work. It, it works enough that we were able to get the main page to come up. So step one here, we have a tool called JRuby Lint. Uh, just a linter like a RuboCop sort of thing. Gem install JRuby Lint, you run JR Lint, and for discourse, an application this large, uh, it had a few things to say about it. Uh, lots of little hints and tips, warnings about concurrency. Uh, first of all, what you'll see is it will try to find any unsupported libraries and supported extensions. Uh, these, the list of extensions and the alternatives that you can use actually comes from a JRuby wiki page that you can go update, provide uh, a, the name of a C extension, the name of a JRuby equivalent. Everybody else then will run JR Lint and see that alternative. So help us, help us fill this list out. Um, and here you can see the, the name of the CRuby the gem and the suggestions for how to replace it. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, also threading concerns. Doing or equals or plus equals are not guaranteed to be atomic. They might have different results if you have many threads. We will flag those and show you different ways that you can fix those threading problems. Uh, we'll also mention some unsupported or, or poorly supported features like object space, forking, uh, and tell you what you need to do to get around those. Uh, in the case of fork, generally it's using the, the, the multi-process model of MRI, probably won't have to deal with it too much on JRuby. Uh, the next step is replace those C extensions. Uh, why don't we support C extensions? Well, they're often used for performance reasons, which, of course, we don't have as many performance issues. The API is enormous. It's really huge, and there's a lot of difficult things to do. Uh, direct pointer access to CRuby objects is one of the biggest problems. Uh, and we did actually try to support this years ago, but it turned out our implementation to support as much as possible to run C extensions was slower than just writing it in Ruby. Uh, so we dropped that. We recommend different ways to get around this. Um, so we run our bundle install. We see there's some C extensions. Uh, here's the options we're going to run through. Uh, you can remove it if you don't need it. Uh, you can use a pure Ruby version if the performance is okay. Uh, you can use a native library and just call into it using FFI. Uh, I won't go into details of that, but there's plenty of talks about FFI. You can call a Java library, just like I showed at the beginning. Or you can also write a, a JRuby C extension. 
the last example I want to show here is the OJ library. So this is an optimized JSON library for parsing and dumping uh, JSON uh, data. Uh, no support for JRuby currently, but it's coming along. Uh, and it's, it's a common dependency of Discourse and many other libraries, so it's something that we kind of have to support. And Tom has been working on this. Uh, OJ for JRuby is about 9,000 lines of Java code compared to 20,000 lines in the C in extension. Most of the tests run minor things uh, that we've just got to work through the edges here. Uh, and it actually performs much better than the C extension. Here is our load performance across the implementations. That's CRuby for a couple different sizes of data, JRuby, and JRuby with OJ, running significantly faster, getting the best out of the JVM. Uh, similarly, on the dump performance, JRuby looking great. And that's it. Once you have that working, once you bundle install, you should be ready to go and deploy your application. Uh, so wrapping up now. Uh, JRuby is here for you. We, we love our users. We're always online. We want to talk to you and see what we can do to help you uh, get more out of Ruby. Uh, we want to help you get the best of the JVM without leaving the Ruby platform, uh, getting the best out of the JIT and garbage collection and deployment. Uh, all of these JVM libraries, all of these languages, if you want to start playing with Scala or Kotlin or Clojure, we have plenty of hybrid apps out there that use those together with Ruby code. So scale up your applications. Save money on all the server resources you're, you're using to run them. And let's keep the, the Ruby dream alive. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. That's party time. Um, I think we have a, a few minutes for a couple of questions from the audience. Awesome. So um, the first one is you mentioned discourse. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk about what are some other uh, large or well-known production applications or companies using JRuby that, uh, that you know? Sure. Let, let's, let's see. I know that, uh, for example, SoundCloud runs a, a significant portion of their stuff on JRuby. Uh, a favorite of mine, uh, the BBC News uh, website, uh, all of the election results that are displayed, you can imagine the, the kind of overhead that they would have displaying election results. That's actually a JRuby application. It's not Rails. They've built their own custom little microservice setup, but all of those results are served as a JRuby application. Uh, one of the more fun ones is uh, the, the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, it's a radio telescope array out in California. It's used as part of the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, last I heard, uh, JRuby is actually used to coordinate all of the different telescopes. Uh, of course, they've got some C++ or assembly that's actually moving these things around, gathering all of the data, uh, but they use a JRuby console to, to search for aliens. I think that's pretty awesome. Great. One more question. Um, as far as teams migrating from CRuby over to JRuby, what are the common problems that, you, that they tend to run into? Startup time. That's pretty much the, the, the major thing. Um, we, we understand that this is a problem. It's a problem for us, too. We, we, have, we use JRuby every day, all day, and we have to work around this. Uh, as I mentioned, we are working on various ways to improve this. Uh, that dash dash dev flag continues to get a little bit better every, over every release. The JVM itself starts to get a little bit better over every release. Um, so we are getting there. It is, it is improving over time. The next thing people run into would be uh, C extensions, libraries that don't have a JRuby equivalent. Most of the time, there's a JVM library that's out there. Like nine times out of 10, you can just pull in a JVM library, wrap, let a little, write a little wrapper code around it, and your application's up and going again. In the rare cases where you do need to write it in uh, a, a, a JVM native language, uh, you could use Scala or Kotlin or Clojure if you don't want to use Java. Uh, there's no reason you have to be tied into that one language. Um, so that usually helps mitigate the problem pretty well. All right. All right. Thanks Thank very much. much. Yeah.